Uh, so now to Professor Ogabaro Duombo, uh, who is the director of the Malaria Research and Training Center at the University of Bamako in, in Mali. Uh, and Ogo, uh, I'd like to, if you could say a few words about how clinical trial platforms are essential and the importance of ethical standards for developing countries and developing country research. Thank Nick. I would like to articulate uh, around three topics. First, uh, building clinical trial platform in Africa uh, to perform phase 1A to phase 3 trials uh, to develop product against tropical negative disease. We are working with the most vulnerable population. They are neglected population. That means the awareness in terms of ethics become very high and we will, we will need to focus more on the volunteers' pro on protection, the data integrity, in order to provide evidence-based product. We are working with, with really the most vulnerable populations. Secondly, all the existing platform now for clinical trials in Africa are really opportunity-based. They are not inside our academic, as they said, to build cap critical mass of capacity to maintain a high level of clinical trials possible in Africa. In the malaria uh, uh, community, most of the network where we are conducting now our trials comes from the drug development and RTSS vaccine. And uh, to have a sustainable uh, group, uh, like uh, the NEH Mali uh, example, the, T uh, the TDR and EDCP, a Big Pharma, and with Wal Walter Reed, I think we need to factor in the clinical trial platform the critical mass and the career factor, per career path. What we are seeing, all those well-trained people after uh, the end of the trial, they are phagocytized by Big Pharma, by NGO, by WHO, and they are gone. And we are really playing the game again and again. This is really the lack of career um, path, and that is something what I, need, and I would like to point out. The third thing is really it's good to have a good investigator in terms of lab and clinical, but the missing piece are really the data management to enable our country to track all the safety data, how we can articulate with the national authority for phase of four and pharmacovigilance. This is the missing piece we need to factor on. And the DSMB and all the clinical monitors, we need a clinical mass of Africans really to be able to defend the volunteer safety. This is coming uh, still from outside. And the last things I would like also to share with you is really the future. The future of maintaining such platform in Africa will depend on our capacity to articulate with the national regulatory authorities ready to follow the pharmacovigilance. Because these drugs sometimes are developed in a fast-tracked way, and we don't know what will be the, the SAEs if we apply in a public manner. This is something I would like to point out. The third thing we, we need to do in the future is how we can use, as uh, it has been said, the new technology for pharmacogenetics to build in our clinical uh, trials in Africa. And our capacity really to have PK and PD capacity in Africa for clinical trials. I think uh, that will help us to use our natural product, which could have an additive value for, uh, to address the issue of NTDs in Africa. Thank you. Thanks, Ogo. Um, how much of this research uh, in drug development do you think should be done in the north and how much in the south? Or do you think that's an artificial and unnecessary distinction? As I said during the, uh, the, the length, 
I think this is artificial. The globalization of the ACA GCP uh, platform is, uh, has to be considered as a continuity. If we are seeing now all the phase uh, preclinical studies, phase 1A are done in the north and where the product is uh, uh, invented. We are bringing them uh, at the stage of phase one, uh, uh, 1B. Why? It's not because of the safety issue, but it's because of the lack of the capacity of African nation to be able to deal with any uh, 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 SAEs. Uh, South Africa are able to do a phase 1A, and we in uh, West Africa, we can't do it. I think if you build such capacity, critical math platform, we will have a continuum of ACA GCP from phase 1A to phase, uh, phase 3. And so part of that capacity is, is preventing phagocytosis, as you pointed out. Definitely. And could you give us some tips on how we could do that? I mean, do we provide, for example, clinical investigators with a career? Do they have something in a developing world, uh, my impression, and I'd be interested in yours, is that we provide short-term incentives, but a young and bright scientist, investigator, physician, whatever, doesn't see a life which will support them and their family. Exactly. It's why uh, I think uh, for sustainability of the well-designed existing platform is really our uh, innovation to see how we can maintain this platform. In Mali, we have example. What we did with all our uh, partners, starting with NEH and TDR, and as soon as a PhD comes back, and the government offered to him an academic position as an assistant professor. And at the time he is involved in any clinical trials, after three years, he is a good postdoc who is able really to be an independent scientist. And being an independent scientist now, he can go to compete at the international level for a grant in any uh, agency to sustain his career and have a kind of additive salary in the uh, things. By doing that, we are able to maintain 95% of our PhD. If they haven't any career path within universities or research institution, it's only based on opportunity. I think we will face again with agocytosis. Please come to the microphones if you have any questions for Olga. Uh, one more from, uh, from me. Uh, coming back to this question of, of supporting the products, in this case the drugs, once they've actually been developed, um, you, you're, you're saying that we just don't have the infrastructure or structures to uh, support these drugs once they're out there. We don't have the ability to assess their quality, to look for substandard or fake, what we now call falsified medicines. We don't have the ability to measure drug levels in the, in the blood. Shouldn't this be something that we demand? Uh, or should I say, perhaps this will come on to Leonard's uh, talk, shouldn't this be something that actually is required by a regulatory authority that there is sufficient support for these uh, products once they have been registered? Well, I think uh, we should avoid what I say, the, the Garibu demand. You know, the Garibu was our was Quranic student where they go to bug for, uh, for eating. It's the time for our really uh, government to have a culture of having clinical development and uh, technology transfer as part of the development in our country. We should have uh, ad, uh, external money. That is really something we, we are doing now. And our innovative way to build up a national capacity to put money in such an uh, art, uh, articulate way between uh, uh, investigators and uh, regular authorities, if we have national budget, we'll be able to start something in pharmacovigilance. But now, all those things are done by outside, and it's not sustainable. I have to be frank. Well, let me ask a question of the researcher in French. I have two parts to my question. My question is about your local human resources that you use to talk about your platforms. Because I heard you speak essentially about uh, your uh, PhD students, professors, uh, who specialize in a given field. 
you are not mentioning your doctors and all those agents or operators or even those who work in laboratories or in the pharmaceutical industry who are there at a baseline, baseline level and who remain there and work with any other partners. You know, you're only talking about the specialists, so talk to me about the others in Western Africa and elsewhere where that you have worked uh, if you haven't used the local resources. And the second is about your ethical committee, your code of ethics. What is it that you are pushing now with your regulatory authorities? At what level will it ha happen? What are you going to do to ensure that there really be this platform to protect all the people, all the volunteers who are involved in research, you know, so what's the uh, ethics committee going to do about it? Well, thank you very much for your question. Now, as far as your first question is concerned, since I've got, I only had five minutes, I didn't push it. When I'm talking about a clinical platform for de development, the critical mass, look at Mali, where we have six uh, is SAI GTIs or whatever. We have five pe four people, and we train them all together. It's a package. You've got the PI, co-PI, the coordinator, the lab investigator, nurse, a data manager, and so on. So they all go together. We train them together in order to uh, tr run a trial on ethics, for instance, GCP, GLA. It's not just the professors. The professors don't play a role there. They're not very good in um, clinical trials. They design them. They design them but others run them. They deliver them to the PI and so on. And the other ones whom we um, register. And in our African network, this certification is done with at the uh, CLSA level. So we get international certification for these trials. Now, the CLIA laboratories are technicians who receive the certification. I'm not talking just of high-level professors. As far as ethics goes, your question on ethics. The ethical standards have been developed just in these last 20 years. Let me give you an example. There are three phases of these ethics. There was the pre-colonial phase where we worked for Africa, post-colonial up to the 1980s where we worked with Africa, and now to date where Africans are able to be part and parcel of this process, and that's completely changed the look of things. WHO, NIH, ADCP have set up training platforms at ethical levels, and as a result, the present uh, ethical committees are have a very appreciated ethical standard which fits with our civil society. L one more example. Look at the certification process of the ethical committees via the FDA and the WHO. Now, each committee to receive this certification must give a clearance for a protocol of studies going on at phase three. They must have that federal-wide assurance. If you have that from the FDA, that means you're being monitored as an ethical committee and that you're being judged and analyzed. If not, you lose that degree. And that level, that standard has gone up in Africa, and which is something we really appreciate. Right, uh, thank you very much. Uh, now, you've made a very, you've advocated very clearly the need to improve uh, the ability of uh, carrying out cl clinical trials. But how about epidemiology? The epidemiology methods are very p relevant for pharmacovigilance, which really requires it. But how about clinical trials? You know, so. How about diabetes, cardiovascular problems, cancer in Africa? Don't you feel that this is also a way of creating a sort of virtuous circle? Thank you. I do believe that uh, th this is, there's a sort of continuity in clinical studies and trials. You know, it's a certain phase of epidemiolo ep epidemiology, and afterwards it turns into clinical trials. And now. In uh, Western, Central, and Eastern Africa that I know of, I have assessed all the DNDI platforms in Eastern, uh, Eastern Africa for Leishman uses. And uh, trial, uh, these trials are just part of the uh, activity. We need a high level of diagnosis of uh, a paper trail of the quality of data, and that's what's given us a longitudinal view of these uh, diseases, which has completely changed uh, um, epidemiology. So today we can talk about the incidence of this, uh, these diseases and their impact, and that is part of uh, what's happening elsewhere, and which we have now on our clinical platforms. Just one last question. No? No questions? 
not the least through the NDI. Thank you for your presentation. I have a perhaps a already simplistic question to ask, but it's very important for us. That is, how do you collect? What about the informed consent of uh, patients? We are supposed to, to write our documents. Uh, they tend to be very lengthy, and we try to use other tools instead. What could you tell us about the best way to inform uh, patients in an honest way without uh, having to give him too uh, much or too many information? I have uh, read somewhere that India is uh, would like to have uh, uh, recorded uh, questionnaires, I mean, uh, take it in writing. Well, this is not solved yet. Since uh, we started with our clinical um, uh, trials, that part of the uh, informed consent took some time. And uh, we wanted to educate uh, our uh, partners about the values, the core values in our uh, villages. And from that starting point onwards, uh, we've uh, drafted a, a, a a process for the informed consent, something that was not initially done in Africa. What is it about? So we, it all begins with the uh, collective authorization. Uh, you have to have this, otherwise you don't even exist. So a clinical trial in Africa starts and the village and the whole, uh, all the village members are uh, involved. So this is an absolute must. You have to start, start with collective uh, authorization. And then we ask a number of selected uh, families, volunteer, uh, families, but see, you need to have the informed, individual informed consent, uh, informed consent. So individual informed consent is key. This is uh, uh, why I refer to the vulnerable population. It's very difficult for the population who is the very far away from Bamako to tell the difference between the team that actually uh, uh, cures or heals and the one who uh, does clinical trial. It takes us a long time to get the message across. We are here in order to do research. Uh, we are supposed to uh, care for them. So if you are frank and honest in on, you can explain every single step of the protocol. And I think that then you can achieve uh, a um, informed consent. We've tested this for trial, uh, trial um, uh, of vaccines, whenever there were side effects, we would put this in the informed consent. The voluntary individuals were informed. You could either leave or drop out or continue with the trial. So there are different types of uh, documents, either paper-based or uh, re recorded or uh, uh, IT. But the most important part is we want to be totally transparent. Uh.